and to have this kind of beauty manifest in the Word, it's produced out of something hard. In verse 3 and verse 15 and verse 18, we kind of see the context of our psalm. David is dealing with enemies. David is dealing with a trial. Um, he is in a hard place. And David is relatively certain that his sin has something to do with it. And we see the main premise of this particular psalm, kind of a, a place of waiting on the Lord. So we have such a beautiful thing, kind of like myrrh, kind of like oil, um, the olive oil that you use in the Bible. You get the sweet smelling aroma and you get the oil, you get the, the beauty of that thing after a period of crushing or after a period of breaking. So that's kind of what's in front of us for Psalm 25. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the evenings you've blessed us with. We're very thankful, Lord. Because of what you have done at Calvary, you have allowed us and given us the blessing and the ability to come into your presence. And that's where we want to be this evening, Lord. So as we study your word, we pray, God, that your spirit would just make the word alive to us. Not just that we would know it, but that we would live it. And we love you, Lord, and we praise you, and we pray in your name. Amen. So David, a lot like many of the other psalms that we have been studying, there's quite a bit of structure to this one. We see kind of the steps and the considerations that David takes as he is bringing this particular thing before the Lord. So we'll pick up verse 1 of Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. The first thing he does is often the thing that we, we always skip step one. Whenever there's a hard thing, whether there's a hard situation, a trial, or just something we don't want to deal with. We've, we've, we've got a whole life of stories for those, and I don't want to bring anybody down right before Christmas, but we're probably going to have a lot more of them. But typically, the first thing we do is we react in the flesh instead of responding in the spirit. And here, Dave says, uh, David, Dave, <laughs> David says, I lift up my soul and I trust in you. This is David showing surrender, submission, and trust. I like how it's described here. Like, I lift up my soul to you. Like, what does that, what does that look like when you're trying to, to picture it? But the thing that kind of hits me about this particular verse, it reminds me of the heave offering. You remember as we went through Leviticus and Numbers, and I think uh, a portion of Exodus, you had those two different types of offerings. You had the, the wave offering, right? They were holding it up, and they were waving it back and forth. Or you had the heave offering, which is the one that they would lift up towards the heavens, essentially dedicating it to the Lord, and them essentially establishing and speaking that witness to the people that they trust the Lord. Remember the first fruits, right? They had that, that heave offering. They're offering that first fruit to the Lord, knowing that he's going to bring in the rest of the harvest in due season. So it kind of reminds me like an offering, but it's also kind of important, you know, where do you put your trust? And it really kind of comes out at the very beginning of whatever hard time we're going through. Typically, we'll respond in the flesh. How am I going to get myself out of this pickle? I got myself in it. I'm going to get myself out. And we kind of readopt some of those, you know, self-made concepts. And here we see David immediately taking it to the Lord. He says, let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. So again, we see the context of the passage. David is dealing with enemies. And it's hard to place this psalm in the kind of a timeline of David's life because he was often dealing with enemies. Before his reign officially started, he was on the run from Saul. Once he took over, he had a, a, a few fights with some enemies. Then he had to deal with um, Absalom. Then he had to deal with Amnon. He had all of these little battles that he was dealing with through the course of his reign and wrestling with his own sins. So when he says here, let me not be ashamed. That word for ashamed essentially means to, to not be let down or to not be disappointed. The thing that would be disappointing 
is if God is lifting his soul and he's trusting in the Lord to deliver him out of this situation or to vindicate him in the situation, and instead his enemies triumph. I like the way that the NASB puts it. And it says, none of those who wait on you shall be ashamed. It really shows the depth of our faith. What is it we commit to the Lord? And what is it that we try and deal with in ourselves? So we see the initial aspect of his prayer. He's turning it over to the Lord. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation, essentially meaning um, refuge or to be delivered out of this hard thing. On you, I will wait all the day. There's probably two ways you could look at this passage. Um, if we'll call it interpretation number one, David would desire, as anybody else probably would, a public vindication. We want to know that we were right. Sometimes we offer our prayers, right? We're in a sticky situation and we give it to the Lord. We think we're right. Or we'll believe we're right. Sometimes we're not seeing the whole story. We don't, sometimes we may not see the offense on our part. But we want to be vindicated in a situation. But just in case we're not. So for interpretation number one, essentially what David is getting at is like, Lord, please deliver me out of this thing. Because I am right. Lord, if I'm not right, I want you to show me that I'm not right. That's kind of a powerful concept because typically when we start kind of getting into it with somebody else or something else, we just want to come out on top. We want to be right. We want to be the victors. We want to be fully established and blameless in the situation. Not many people say a prayer of, Lord, if I am wrong, I want you to show me so that it would cause us to choose a different path. I think the more likely interpretation, interpretation number two, David knows that he is in a mess. And we remember these things reading through first and second Samuel, he would commit his paths to the Lord. He would seek the Lord and the Lord would direct him in the way that he should go. Probably no different for verses four and five. He's wanting God to show him the path that he should be taking. I do believe that's probably the more accurate interpretation. But I'll also say it's probably one of the, you know, maybe equally important as the first one. Our plans are always the best plans until they're not. And typically we don't commit them to the Lord until we've already made more of a mess of things. We've kind of heard it said, like, you know what? You want to get out of the hole, you need to put down the shovel because you're making things worse for yourself. Committing the things to the Lord right out the gate would be the, the smarter of the two. So he's asking the Lord to show him to teach him, and to lead him. This is full submission. We are going to talk about the waiting on the Lord, but we're going, to, we're going to do that once we get to verse 21. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they are from of old. I love that. Because there's really two ways you can look at that verse. David is either considering what God has done from the very beginning of time with people, his mercy and his loving kindness. We see it as early as Genesis chapter 3. Or David could simply be discussing the things that have transpired with the Lord early on in his life. We remember really our first introduction to David. He's, he's facing Goliath. And David is moving forward in boldness because he knew that the Lord was with him. He's saying from of old, David is emboldened or a better word is probably encouraged because of his past dealings with the Lord. We'll have it up here on the screen for you. But first Samuel chapter 30, verse six kind of parallels this passage uh, quite nicely. Now, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened, or the more accurate, encouraged himself in the Lord his God. It's a very deliberate thing. It's not going to typically, I don't think, happen by accident. 
He's making a decision to be encouraged in the Lord by remembering the things that the Lord has done before. Either the things in our own lives, because we're so quick to forget it. It simply impresses me just in my own life, and I know better. Oh, I know better. I'll get hit with one trial or a hard thing, and I'll give it to the Lord, and He'll bring us out of it. A month later, you know, we're in the, like, the exact same pickle. It's like, man, what am I going to do here? <laughs> we are creatures of habit when it comes to forgetting those things, which is why we really should keep a, just a journal, either a prayer journal or just things that God has done with our life. But we also need to be in our Word. We need to be reading our Bibles every day so that can, we can be refreshed and renewed and be brought to a remembrance of the thing that God has done, not just for us, but throughout the course of our history. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, whether in his youth or the sins that he has just in his past. He's not asking God to look on him in that way, but according to your mercy, remember me, or to look upon. He's praying upon, he's praying on God's prior work, he's praying on God's character, he's praying on God's love, and he's praying on God's mercy. That's probably the best kind of prayers that we can offer up. It's a dangerous place when we start praying on our own. Lord, can you save me because I am righteous? That's a dangerous place because typically the way we judge righteousness is not the same way God would judge it. Or Lord, will you please in your justice look into my situation? That's a hard one because we have to remember God is just and God is holy. Again, there might be something we're missing. It's neat that David Moore prays on God's mercy and his loving kindness, rather his justice. We used to have people all the time that would come and pray before their court cases. Like, Pastor, I need you to pray that my court case rules in my favor. And we know typically whenever someone's going to bring something like that to you, they're only going to give the details to make them look good because you want to win. It's just kind of in our nature. They quit doing it. So I'll say, Lord, let your perfect will and your perfect justice be done in this situation. They don't do that no more. Nobody asked me to pray over their court cases as much. Because justice, especially his justice, he can see all things, is a lot heavier than we often consider. So we can see that really the direction that David is taking. Somewhere in David's life, because there were many, sin puts us into that hard place. Sin puts us on the run. And it happened often with David. David was not a flawless individual that the Lord was using. So we'll see in multiple places through the course of Psalm 25 and through the rest of the Psalms, where David is praying for his iniquities, his wickedness, his sin and transgression, and praying for forgiveness. For your goodness sake, O Lord, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. Such a powerful concept because we often think, well, Lord only teaches the righteous in the way. But God's goodness is demonstrated and God's goodness is shown as a benefit to sinners. Specifically in Psalm 25, we're going to talk about two different kinds of sinners. The humble and the reverent. That's what we're dealing with in verses 8 through 15. He teaches sinners in the way. What way? Could be eternal life, how to live for him, how to walk in wisdom, how to walk in holiness, or simply how to navigate out of the storm. He's going to teach sinners in this way. Again, there's going to be two types of sinners. The first, the humble, he guides in justice. And the humble, he teaches his way. I like that. Why is the humble the first one? The humble can be taught. Because if you are not humble, you are not willing to be taught. I like the word humble because it's a weird word. Typically, if you were to ask 10 Christians what humble means, you ask 10 people, you're going to get 30 different answers on what the word humble means. We typically reconcile it to something physical. 
Well, they speak humbly, meaning they speak softly, or they are gentle in their nature. They dress humbly. You know, they don't wear name brand stuff. There's not logos all over everything. They walk in humility. So you ask them, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to walk in humility? And the typical answer is the wrong ones. Like, well, they really consider themselves to be just less than everybody else and less than everything else. It's like that, that is not humility. That's a wrong perception of yourself. That word for humble, it means to be needy. It means an acknowledgement that you are without resources. That is what the word humble means. Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 5. He says the poor in spirit. It means that they are spiritually bankrupt. So if there was a $1 million fine for them to essentially buy their way out of sin, they recognize that they don't have the $1 million to do it. They recognize that they are needy. It's not just that they recognize and that they acknowledge it, but they act on it. To refuse help when you know you need help. That's the opposite of humble. The humble here in Psalm 25, they recognize that there is a need that they they cannot do, build, achieve, or purchase of themselves. It has to come from someplace else. If someone is not humble or poor in spirit, they are not going to turn to the Lord for help or anybody for help. Likewise, they will not accept it when help is offered. So we can understand kind of what David is saying here. The humble... He, being the Lord, will guide in justice because the humble will allow himself to be led. The humble, he teaches his way because we recognize that our way does not work. Our way drives us further into the deep, dark woods instead of into the open pastures, the open places where God would have us. They're willing to be taught. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, or they're essentially faithful, to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. I like that. I hate sports metaphors because I don't like sports, like any of them, unless you count fishing as a sport, (laughs) which I do. But this is kind of a great metaphor or something can be used out out of football, to keep. What does that mean? to know and obey. It means you're going to hang on to that thing and you're going to go in the direction with it you're supposed to. In order to keep his word, if you will, we have to know it. But it's not just knowing. We can't just be hearers of the word. We also have to be doers of the word. So we have to know and obey. All of those paths are mercy and truth. If we choose not to know, and we certainly choose not to obey, We are not humble before the Lord. We're just not going to accept His gift. Then obviously the path is going to be something quite a bit different. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. I like that. He's praying on the name of the Lord, meaning he's praying on the character of the Lord. And he says that my iniquity, it is great. Sometimes that is the stumbling block in our iniquity, in, in, in our sin, in our humility. We don't recognize that our sin is great. We're used to it. We're really numb, whether it's cultural or we've let our relationship with the Lord grow cold. We don't recognize how great our sin is. We have to understand that even the smallest ounce of leaven mixed into our lives it brings condemnation. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's what sin essentially is, purchases for us. It's death, even the smallest amount of it. In the New Testament, it says that if you break one just iota of the law, you're guilty of breaking all of the law. How heavy is our sin? Jesus says, you know, if you call your brother raka, I love that word. If you call your brother useless, worthless, or probably more reconciled in our own vernacular today. It's like, oh, you idiot. How many of us have let that one slip? It's like, oh, you dope. 
That's been my new one lately. I don't know why. But Jesus says, you know what? If you call your brother useless, you're, you're guilty of condemnation. If you are so angry towards your brother, it's something that could lead to murder, something that, that's starting in the heart, you're guilty of condemnation. If you look at another woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. You can see just how serious sin is. So he recognizes the severity of his sin because the law demands that that sin be, that you be punished for it. But the other aspect of his sin being so great, we have to recognize who it is that we're sinning against. That's the big one. Not just the severity and what it leads to. Sin leads to eternal condemnation. But who we're sinning against, we don't really think about that one so much. We think that we're sinning against somebody else. Now, it breaks our hearts if we respond or react to somebody that kind of ruins the situation. It's like, oh, that's a bummer. But do we realize that when we sin, we sin against the Lord? Remember the story of Joseph and the wife of Potiphar, right? He was sold into slavery. Potiphar was the Egyptian that bought him. He worked as basically the head servant in all of Potiphar's household. And his wife was starting to make some passes at Joseph. And what does Joseph say? He's like, oh, how can I sin against Potiphar? His response is, how can I sin against the Lord? So when you start to recognize even these little small offenses, these things are against the Lord. So David recognizes and says that his sin is great, and he's begging for a pardon of his iniquity. So verses 8 through 11, humility. That's the first type, if you will, of sinner that God teaches in the way because they can be taught because they're humble. Verse 12, we're going to deal with the reverent. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. That fear is speaking of a reverence, a deep respect for the Lord. So when God says something, we're going to respond. We kind of understand this one. In our culture, in any functioning society, there is authority, and there are those that are subject to the authority. That one's really easy for me, being in the, the military for 12 years. There's guys that are in authority over me that I do not like. Not even a little bit. There's cops, politicians, hall monitors, whatever it is, pastors, that we just don't like them very much because they're dopey or they're ridiculous or they're idiots or whatever it is. Maybe it's the way they cut your hair. You're, you're that petty. You just don't like them because they have a weird haircut. But you're going to do as they say, maybe not the way we probably should do it, but we're going to respond appropriately out of respect because they have a position of authority over us. So God is talking about that particular sinner as well. And he shall teach him in the way he chooses, just a reminder of the sovereignty of the Lord and that not everybody's path or the way that they are walking in Christ and things that God is going to bring them through is going to be the exact same as everybody else's. That's why all of your testimonies are different. Save one, essentially us being broken at the cross, us being humbled in that particular way. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. So the path in the Lord, that is the outcome. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. It's a spiritual concept. They're going to gain a deeper understanding of his word and brought into a deeper understanding, a fuller understanding, a more fruitful understanding of his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. How amazing. It's not necessarily that things are easier when we're keeping our eyes on the Lord. But the way we function in the situation or in the environment that we find ourselves in, that is easier. We're able to, as believers, thrive even in the most difficult of situations. It's when we take our eyes off of Jesus that it becomes a problem. One of my favorite aspects of that is Peter. Peter, when he saw Jesus walking on the water, we remember that, we remember that story. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, 
command me to come out to you. What was Peter's motivation? He wanted to, he wanted to move to the Lord. So Peter gets out of the boat, dude's walking on water. It's something that I wish I could have seen. Because how are the disciples responding who are still stuck in the boat? They're probably freaking out a little bit. They're fishermen. They know you don't go swimming in tumultuous waters. It's a great way to find yourself the, the wrong way at the bottom of the water. So they're probably begging him not to go. Or they're just shocked that Peter's going to do it. Some of them are probably not surprised that it's Peter getting out of the boat. And Peter starts walking towards Jesus. Everything is fine as long as his eyes are fixed on Jesus. And it tells us in the text, as soon as he takes his eyes off the Lord and starts looking at what? The waves. Then he starts to panic. Then he starts to feel fear. And anybody who spends any time out in the open water, we kind of understand that one a little bit. It's like, oh, that wave is going to be terrible. I love surfing. I don't like the breaks in Carlsbad. Because there's not just one. The whole concept, you know, when you're surfing is you want to get over the break so you can get behind the wave and ready, ready to go in. The problem with some of the particular breaks in Carlsbad, there's like four. And trying to paddle through a break, it just it hurts your heart. And if you're out of shape, like some of us, it hurts more than that. And every time you see the wave, and the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, it's kind of disheartening. When we look at the storm, when we look at the trial, when we look at the hard thing, it forces us. That's kind of the, it's going to force us into two places. It's going to force us to be kind of self-absorbed into the problem, or it's going to cause us to pursue the Lord. And David here is like, you know what? My eyes are fixed. He's choosing. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. Why? He shall pluck my feet out of the net. Again, the reference back to the hard thing in dealing with the enemies. He is in a snare with someone pursuing him, and he's looking to the Lord to get him out of the hard situation that he is in. So these are the two sinners that will receive the instruction of the Lord, the humble and the reverent. And we see essentially the concept of the humility of David's heart when he says, my eyes are ever toward the Lord. He shall pluck me out of the net. We could probably spend a full hour just on that verse. David, I know we haven't gotten there yet on our Friday night studies. David was a man of war. He was a warrior, not just capable of delivering himself from his enemies. But if you read in first Kings, it talks about the men that he established over the ranks. One of his guys, I can't remember which one it was, one of them, the son of Benai, I think, he killed 800 guys in one sitting. That's intense. David was a very capable warrior. And yet, he still recognizes that he does not have the resources of himself to deliver himself. If we could adopt a heart like David, I couldn't even imagine how strong the church would be. Because anymore in churches, we look at programs, more secularized worship, entertainment for teachings. If numbers start getting low, we start to look at ourselves like, you know what, what can we do to put more butts in more seats? We start to look at the things that we need to do. It's like, how can I make the gospel more palatable so that I can try and reach more people? Now we're starting to be producers of the miracle instead of dispensing, be dispensers of the miracle or of the work. Verse 16, we continue to see David pleading essentially with the Lord, turn yourself to me and have mercy on me for I am desolate and afflicted. We're often in a place as believers. Lord, why is this happening to me? We ask it a lot. And we internalize it quite a bit. Especially when it comes to the concept of our own, of our own sin. Or our awareness that our sin has put us into that particular situation. But we get to that place of being desolate and afflicted. Desolate and hurt. That word for desolate means lonely. 
when we are in trial, we do feel alone. The biggest reasoning behind a lot of our afflictions, it's supposed to drive us to the Lord. It's supposed to drive us to prayer. It's supposed to drive us into the Word. Eventually, it's going to drive us to a place of fellowship. And he's asking the Lord to turn himself to look on David, that the troubles of his heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses and look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. This is David being completely open with the Lord. David is not asking, he's like, Lord, you know that I'm kind of mostly good. And I kind of almost always do the things that you ask me to do. Anybody that's done a study over the character of David, <laughs> he was more on one side than he was the other. David is aware of his iniquity. He is aware that he's spiritually bankrupt. He's aware that he's in a place that he cannot deliver himself. So he's demonstrating humility and reverence as he's asking God to look at his particular situation. But this is what sin does to us. It renders us in a place of affliction and of loneliness. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with a cruel or a violent hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed or let down disappointed. For I put my trust in you. Love the verbiage. When we, David essentially speaking of putting his trust in the Lord, he's committing the whole situation and just kind of putting it in God's hands. The connotation here is once you put it in the hands, you're not supposed to be trying to take it back. So we have humility and reverence as kind of an aspect of deliverance. But when we commit a situation to the Lord, we keep trying to peek around the corner to see what God's doing with it. Or it's like, you know, Lord, I found a better way. How many times have we kind of done that one? We'll commit something to the Lord, and then 10 minutes later, it's like, oh, I could just do this. And then we find out that we probably should have put down the, the shovel five minutes prior to that particular situation. When we put it in the Lord's hands, we leave it there. That is trust. Just like when you have a safety deposit box at the bank or safe in your house, you're putting something in there for safekeeping because you understand there's no better or safer place that it can be. David is saying, Lord, all of this mess, I'm going to put it in your hands and my soul. Everything that I am, I'm going to put it in your hands for you to reconcile, for you to fix. And he's going to leave it in the hands. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. It's worded a little funky in the New King James, but he's not saying, Lord, let my integrity and my, um, my uprightness preserve me. David already understands that he is full of iniquity. Essentially what David is praying is help from the Lord to hold him up while God is dealing with this thing. Because we're getting back to the concept of waiting for the Lord. This is always one of my favorite things to talk about. Because we see waiting... Most often described, in, again, in our vernacular, we see it as a passive waiting. I'm going to put it in here, and then if I remember to check on it in a couple of weeks, we're going to do that. It's not a passive thing. Waiting is hard. This is an active word. Choosing to remain in place, waiting for the Lord to deal with it. We have to understand, and some of us understand more than others, Waiting is hard. And, and we'll have it on the screen for you. Psalm 69, verse 3. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Essentially what he's saying is, I am weary in waiting. Have you ever been so tired of waiting for something that it's caused us to respond negatively? I'm sure we've all kind of been there in one situation. Or another. Waiting can be the hard part. After the promise was given to Abraham and Sarah, how long did they have to wait before Isaac was born? But they got tired of waiting. So Sarah decided to go with Hagar instead. Sometimes we're waiting on God to do a work 
and we don't know how long we're supposed to be waiting. One of my favorite examples is the 120 disciples that were in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. Jesus says, tarry in Jerusalem until the promise is fulfilled for you. Did you notice in the text that it didn't actually say how long? They were just told to wait there. What's an appropriate time for us to wait? And I love asking Christians that question. It's like, well, I want to buy this new truck. Oh, I want to buy a house. Oh, I want to, I want to go and minister. I'm going to go plant a church somewhere. I can't wait for someone to come and tell me. It's like, I want to go plant a church somewhere. It's like, all right. Are you going to pray on it? He's like, oh, yeah. I've already set a timeline for God to respond. It's like, oh, what's that? The typical answers are either three days or one week. Three and seven. That's like the church's holy numbers. Three and seven. After that, we're going to make a decision. It's like, well, what if God doesn't want to answer you until day eight or day 350? It's like, oh, but we already gave him a timeline. You got to be careful. It's one of the things I love about afterglows. Something that Calvary chapels are pretty fond of. That we will sit together in a room, typically as pastors, Worship is still going, but we will sit there and we will pray or we will sit there in silence and wait on a word from the Lord. And you'll see some guys wait in there for four or five hours. What's the purpose of waiting? Because it's worth it. They're waiting for a word from the Lord or they're waiting for a direction from the Lord and the waiting is worth it to the humble and to the reverend because we want to be taught and we want to be obedient. So David just makes it pretty clear. He doesn't say how long he's going to wait. He was on the run from Saul for a number of years. But he's going to wait on direction from the Lord. In verse 22, he ends his psalm with a prayer. Redeem Israel, O God, out of their troubles. He has a prayer for deliverance. He's lifting up the nation. The word wait, we see a lot. The concept of the trials in the psalm, we see a lot. And the concept of what our sin and iniquity does to us, we see that aspect all mixed into the psalm. In this season, it's very likely to feel lonely. It says, God, why am I, going, why am I in this, this deserted place? I have to remind you, some of the most amazing things in all 66 books of the Bible transpired in a deserted place. So much growth. Such a beautiful, just things came out of the deserted places. Because for the sweet smelling aroma or for the anointing oil to be made, first, both of these things, the myrrh and the olives, both of these things had to be crushed. So if we're in this place right now, we're like, Lord, it's just pressing in. What is God trying to do? Steer you back towards him. To put you on a path that he wants you to be on. It's just hard to see the path when our, our eyes are just foggy. Our minds are foggy or we're distracted. We just have so much stuff going in. God wants you. That's what he wants. You and your honesty, you and your heart. Lord, I am a sinner. That doesn't mean that God's going to shove you away. What is he doing here? He teaches sinners in the way. That's fantastic news because that's pretty much all we have sitting in the room tonight. But we have to yield all the time. And I got to remind myself of it. Like how long is the spiritual warfare going to last? How long is this pressing going to last? How long is this crushing going to last? I wish I had a better way to say it, and I probably do, which is why I need Megan. Because like, you know what? It's not going to stop till you learn your lesson. Because when we yield ourselves to the Lord, and we're doing something we shouldn't be, or God wants us to grow or to learn, sometimes it takes the place of crushing to produce fruit, to produce that sweet-smelling aroma. So if we're in that lonely and deserted place and you feel like you're being crushed, God's drawing you closer to himself. If you are not in a place where you're being crushed right now, point one, don't worry, it's coming. Point number two, find one who is. 
Find one who is and be a blessing with words of life and truth from the word through prayer to help them see the path that they're supposed to be on. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the evening. Lord, this is an encouraging text because we can see that you still choose to interact with us even though we are leaky. Lord, this is a challenge text because humility is often a word that we either don't understand or we only wear as a mask. But we do know, Lord, how you hate the prideful of heart. Do we choose to deliver ourselves, in essence, telling you, God, that we do not need you? So, Lord, those of us that need it as the challenge text, God, I pray, Lord, that we would be humbled. Lord, we recognize that we are spiritually bankrupt that we do not have the resources to be delivering ourselves and it's a hard place to break out of but nevertheless Lord we do need to overcome that thing especially in this season so Lord thank you so much for just pouring into us this evening in teaching us your way. We pray, God, that you would help us to continue on it. And we love you and we praise you and we pray in your holy name. Amen.